So today's session is on the four C's and language classrooms. We're going to do, I just want to see what Victor is saying. So I'm, as usual, if you know me, I always start with a story. So I'm going to tell a short story. We're going to look at the history and benefits of what the four C's and 21st ed century education are. We're going to look at some do's and don'ts and benefits. And at the same time, I'm going to show you some activities that I think are very useful that you can integrate right now. Just small changes you can make to really upgrade what we're doing in our classrooms. We just got some more people too, right? Okay, great. This is awesome. Um, right, so let's get started. I always start with a story. So uh, about eight years ago, I started to hear this term uh, four C's. I was working for a big Swedish English teaching company. And I used to, um, I kept on hearing this word four C's, four C's. And I, I'm quite cynical. So I thought, oh, it must just be another marketing scam. It's just another way to get people to spend more money in English schools. So at first, I just dismissed it as if it wasn't anything. But then I thought I should look them up, right? So I started to look at what these four C's are. And I started to realize the more I read and the more I tried in my classroom and integrated into my classroom, that it started to have this huge impact on the way I taught. So here's one of my classes recently. But you know, it really started to change the way my students approached me by having more chances to communicate, collaborate, think about things and create it and be more creative. But what it did was it started to put learning at the center of my classes, not me, not students, but learning started to happen in the classroom a lot more. So I, for me, I became a massive advocate of the four C's and I trained on them all over the place. And I even ended up interviewing one of the four founders of the four C's. So Let's have a look at what they are. What I started to realize, though, after a while, was they started to realize I'm not teaching these students the four C's. Our students come to us with the four C's. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll dig deeper into what they are, but they come to us with the ability to communicate, to be creative, to, to think about things, to collaborate with friends. That's what they do all the time, naturally. But what we, what we see is, and what I was doing a lot of, I was destroying these in my kids. You know, kids would try to ask a question and I'd say, oh, you can't talk now. Or, oh, my, ca my camera keeps going out of focus. That's better. Um, you know, I, I would stop kids um, working together because I didn't want that naughty boy to be with a naughty boy. So I was stopping collaboration. Or a child would come up with a new uh, idea and I would sort of say, oh, no, we're going to do this. And I would be stopping their critical thinking and creativity. So... And I also used to be a Trinity College London examiner, and I saw a lot of teachers doing this, sort of not encouraging these skills and enhancing them, but almost destroying these skills in kids. What we do see is we see a lot, oh, hi, Mika. Mika Tamura, it's, we got Japan as well today. That's great, good to meet you. So what I realized, these kids come to our classes with these skills. And sometimes I was destroying them. So that's, that's not good. So I wanted to really change the way I always, how, how I teach. So that's a sort of a bit of background for you to think about why I got into the four C's and how I can then tell you what I have discovered about the four C's in the last eight years. So let's look at some history and benefits. So what are the four C's? Let's type them in quickly, guys. Just type one of them any of the four C's. I hope you know most of them by now. Go, Kate. Okay, creativity, my favorite one, actually. Who else? We'll get all four of them on the screen. Yeah, communication, excellent. Anyone? Victor, who's gonna be fastest? Oh, Kate, you're so fast today. Collaboration, good, Brian, excellent. Oh, cognition, actually, it's not considered one of the four C's, but it's a great another one. Like, can, I also use the word connection and confidence. These are all C words. Yeah, it's the fifth one, right? Cognition. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on. So the, these are what have been considered the four C's. We have, let me just get my pen, my marker. So we have creativity, right? Uh, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. I, I, it, I'm not sure, right, why did they choose these four? Why do they all have to start with a C? 
But it's interesting. I mean, they do seem to all work. Cognition, I guess, could come under critical thinking and creativity. Um, yeah, I know, Mika, a lot of people talk about content now being as one of the C's as well and cognition. But these, these were considered the four C's. So where did they come from? Oh, let's just quickly do, let's just quickly do a definition. Of course, I'm not, I won't give you the def, I'm going to give you a definition. You just have to type in which one of the four C's this is. So you're going to see a definition and type in which one it is. Let's have a look. So a few definitions on the screen. I'm getting you to critically think about it <laughs> and then type in to communicate about it. Which one is this one? Yeah, of course. So critical thinking is about using various different types of reasoning, right? Analyzing the whole parts of something and interpreting information. For small kids, because I'm a young learner, uh, that's my passion, it might just be comparing two things. It might just be saying this is big and this is small. But that's the beginning of critical thinking, just analyzing the difference between things. Very good, Brian. You win the first prize today. I, I don't know what the prize will be, but I'm sure I'll get you something. Uh, next, who can get this one? Which of the four C's is this? Who's going to be fastest? Brian? No? Mika, the winner from Japan. Good job there. Yeah, so communication is just, are you able to articulate thoughts and ideas effectively? Orally, written, or non-verbal. It's the ability to convey a message, and it's also the ability to listen and understand what the people are saying. This is a big one that often gets missed in language teaching classrooms. But look, it's simple as a student might not even be able to speak, but they can hand up and point. That's the ability to communicate. And we tend to sometimes we tend to tell kids, shh, don't speak or don't use your L1, right? If you're telling them not to use their L1, maybe you're actually crushing their ability to communicate. Let's go on to the next one. What's this one? Oh, Paul Granger, Mr. Thailand is here as well. Yeah, collaboration. Kate, you're, on, you're a star today. Great job. Yeah, so this is just working, working together with other people. Demonstrate the ability to work effectively with other people. Now, um, I, I, I work in China mainland, and this is a big problem because a lot of kids go to big classrooms with 50 kids in rows. And they're not allowed to communicate and, I mean, collaborate with other kids. It's all individual testing. And this is a big problem in China because when kids leave school or leave high school, they've never really learned how to collaborate with anyone. And as soon as they start working, they have to collaborate. So this is a problem in China. And, I, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this in, you know, maybe in Thailand, maybe in Vietnam. I know you have very big classes there. So I think our job is to make sure you know, we're, we're really pushing the collaboration. And the last one is obviously creativity. Creativity means two things. One, it's being innovative and thinking of new ideas. But it also means, I, a lot of people put solving problems with critical thinking, but I think creativity is about solving problems, looking at new ways to do um, old problems, right? So there they are, the four. We know what they are, the four Cs. So let's continue. Where did these come from? Oh, very quick question, very quick question. I have the two green ones here, are communication and collaboration, and the two blue ones are creativity and critical thinking. What do you think is the difference between the green ones and the blue ones? The green ones and the blue ones. Mika, Nadia, you're doing well. Ooh, yeah, which one? The green. Yeah, Nadia, I like that. The green ones are about interaction, right? Ooh, look, everyone's typing so fast today. I can't keep up with you all. <laughs> Working with people, yeah, I like that one. Who else? I want to see what everyone says before I reveal what I think it is. Yeah, Brian. Brian, exactly, right? Oh, Mark Yellen. I know you from somewhere. How do I know you? <laughs> The green for a group blue can use light. Ooh, that's a nice way to look at it, Ekaterina. I'd never thought of it like that, actually, Kate. 
the Greenberg group and the other one is working alone. Yeah, that's quite interesting way to look. Yeah, these are nice. Ah, Paul Granger. Green is people. Blue can do alone. Yeah, I like it. Okay, so I just think it for me it's this. Communication and collaboration are things that you you have to do with other people, right? You can't communicate to yourself exactly what you just said, and creativity and critical thinking are cognitive. They're inside. So, yeah, great. And it's, it's nice when you start to look at it like that because then you can break them into two and sort of think, am I doing this or this? What you'll find is, though, they all overlap, right? I mean, it's obvious that, you know, if you're doing critical thinking, they're probably doing some creativity. And if you're communicating, well, you must be collaborating, right? So a lot of them overlap. And I think by the end of this session, you'll notice that, the four C's become a big C in the middle. So, oh, have you, who's heard this term? What are 21st century skills? Because four C's are kind of like an, a, a subsect of 21st century skills. So let's have a look, you don't have to answer, but this idea of 21st century skills first came about in around 2002 um, from a group called the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. You might have seen this sort of diagram before. And they talk about that these are the skills that children will need to really adopt in the, for, the, for the coming century, right? Now, as I always say, these aren't skills that kids didn't have before. We've always had uh, the, the skills of critical thinking and communication, but they'll become more, uh, uh, more prevalent in the 21st century. So this group looked at things like they'll need to know about information, technology, and media. They'll need the three key subjects, which is reading, writing, and arithmetic, <laughs> the three R's. They'll need life skills, and they'll need, but that kind of got developed. I still think that's a little bit old school. In 2008, um, this book came out. Uh, this book is probably the most famous book on 21st century skills. It came out in 2008, and it was written by Charles Fidel. Charles Fidel was a guy who used to work at uh, Cisco Systems. He was a computer a computer guy. He used to sell computer stuff. And he was in charge of a big department, lots of kids coming through, first time they're having a job, and they weren't ready for the current day. So he went out and tried to um, write a computer program that was going to, he was going to sell computer programs that were going to help kids change. And it didn't do very well. But while he was doing that, he met a lot of educators and then ended up writing this book called 21st Century Skills. That book led him to meeting lots of governments, uh, the UN, the World Economic Forum, meeting lots of education departments, and starting to help governments integrate 21st century skills into their curriculums. And if, if you type him in, Charles Fidel, he, he has an excellent website called the Centre for Curriculum Redesign. It's not flash, it's not, um, it's not very fancy, but you can download the books there. He's got lots of cool ideas, um, an absolutely fascinating guy. Um, so what, what Charles Fidel said in the 21st century skills, he broke it into three. These are the three main categories. There was learning and innovation, digital literacy, and career and life. For career and life, he said it was all about things like flexibility and adaptability. We all know that, right? Like, our job, I mean, my job has changed so much in the last few years. We're just constantly changing and having to adapt to new things. Lots of cross-cultural interaction. Ah, good example. Right today, we are in the middle of a cross-cultural interaction. This wouldn't have happened 15 years ago. No way. When our parents were young, would they have been communicating with eight countries all at the same time? Um, yeah, and a lot, a lot of data things as well. Like lots of interesting things changing for that. He then talked about digital literacy, that people need to be media literate, they need to be information literate, they need to be able to do this, right? This is something, this is digital literacy. Us logging into a computer, talking to each other now, this is what they mean by the literacy of being online, right? But he also said in that book, we need these four things. We need critical thinking, creativity, communication and collaboration. So that book, just to give you a bit more background on the history, led to his 2015 book, which was the updated version. So if anyone talks to you about 21st century skills, they're becoming almost outdated now. And what we talk about now is this idea of four dimensional education and 21st century education. So what Charles Fidel did is he partnered up with all these universities, Harvard, Yale, all this stuff. Um, Carol Dweck from Yale, who talks about growth mindset. 
and he worked with governments from mainly Finland, Sweden, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, but also I think he's been working with uh, Shanghai government, etc. So lots of places. And he, he came in to saying, look, we have to change our knowledge set. That there's no point in, you know, learning all the history is great, but it's not going to help you get a job in the future. You can just look it up now. It's going to be things like robotics and maths and languages. Languages are going to be important because learning languages is also about, like, computer language as well. He also said he, he kept in the skills, cre critical thinking, creativity, etc. And the third part he put in, which I think is interesting, is this new thing of character, that people need to learn mindfulness. And you'll hear that word, right, mindfulness. You've got schools in, I know there are schools in Finland doing yoga, right, because it's about thinking, uh, curiosity, courage, and ethics. And in a global world, we need more of this. Um, the last point is metacognition is the ability to think about learning. Um, I did a session on learning to learn, and a lot of that came from Charles Fidel's books. So I, I highly recommend Look up Charles Fidel, download his books, check them out. Very, very interesting guy. Um, really cool. Oh, Paul, do you have a comment I'd like to read? Or I'll get to it. Yeah, so that's some background. So just when um, in Denmark, yeah, teaching empathy, right? That's right, Paul. So this whole idea of we, we're not just creating little knowledge balls who did lots of homework. We're creating real people with the skills, the knowledge, and the uh, mind, you know, what do you call it, the the character to be able to be better people in the world. It's very fascinating. Oh, one last point on this is um, Charles Fidel started working with these school with these countries 10 years ago. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the top education systems now in the world, when you look at PISA test, not, not saying PISA test is the best way to judge a school, but when you look at these global tests, we have countries like number one, Finland, Estonia, Sweden, Korea, Singapore, New Zealand, Shanghai, Beijing, etc. These countries that are really adopting this new way of thinking. So I don't think it's a coincidence. So let's go on and think about how does this work for us, language teachers? Let's look at the do's, the don'ts. So we'll look at the don'ts, we'll look at the do's, and then we'll look at some activities. Of course, I'm going to show you some of the stuff from our um, apps and stuff that you can do, but just it'll make you think about what you can be doing. So as I'm showing you these do's and don'ts and activities, think about these questions, okay? These are the questions you should be asking yourself, I think. Number one is, which skills is this, or what skills, I should say, or which skills are the, is this activity or task integrating? So when I'm doing an activity, I don't just say, this is an activity for studying the past tense. I say, this is an activity that's gonna have the past tense with this function and it's also developing collaboration and critical thinking. It's just another thing to add on. Then you think, am I allowing for opportunities for learning? Is there a chance for the kids to really be learning in here? And learning doesn't just have to be, I can say the words. It's, are you able to see them thinking about how they're doing it? And the last question is, how do you know that learning is happening? How do you ever know that the kids have picked up what they've learned? Right, and that's the hardest one because you don't know, they kind of leave. So it's you've got to be watching. Are they trying new things? Are they trying on their own? Then you know there's probably learning happening. Let's have a look. So the first one, let's have a look at creativity. Creativity, some of the things that I've seen traveling around Asia is, like one, things I don't like. These are the three main things I don't like seeing, um, is when the teachers set all the rules. So they just say to the kid, this is the rules and you have to do it this way. I like to do a sort of, here are three rules for the game, but you can make up your, some of your own rules a little bit because that allows them to be engaging more with the content. Um, when the kids have no choice, they can't choose what color they want to do something or they can't choose, you know, simple as that. And when a kid does something very creative and very interesting, then I see teachers sort of saying, that's not what you were told to do. But a lot of the time when they're not told to do something, what they're doing is creative. So let's have a look at what I think we should do. Now, I, guys, I don't expect you to remember this now, and I promise I will share this after. Um, these are just the things I think, and I'm just gonna rattle them off and then show you some interesting activities. Uh, the first one is encouraging different outcomes. It doesn't have to be everyone gets to the same outcome. So some, it's, rather than saying you all have to do this test and finish it, it might be, you need to come up with five sentences or you need to come up with as many sentences as you can 
And then that means there's different outcomes. Um, allowing for choice. I've done a whole webinar, you can go back and look at it on called Learning to Learn. And it's all about if you have choice, kids can have creativity. If they can choose the colors, they can choose what they're gonna draw, they choose the books they're gonna read, that's developing creativity. Um, any music, in my opinion, helps with creativity because you can start changing words, right? Make your own words to the songs and you're allowing for some creative input from each student. Uh, changing the ending to stories, right? Anytime you read a story, just tell them to think about what this story might be at the end, and that's another way you're encouraging innovation. Take from all that information. Um, whenever your kids have work and they finish it, stick it up on the walls. I go to schools now and they have these design rules that they're not allowed to have work on the walls because it doesn't go with the design of the school. What a sad thing that the kids can't get to see the work. So if they're being creative, get it up on the walls and tell everyone about it. One of my favorite is, and everyone used to, I used to think this was a terrible thing to do, but I love it. Let kids draw quietly on their own for a few minutes. Just say, I just want you to draw the three, the three words that you liked most today. Then they've got to think about what does that look like? They've got to go through a cognitive process, right? They've got to go, I've got to think about what a horse looks like, if it's a horse. And then they've got to try and draw it. And then you can go and ask them some questions. But that quiet time is cognitive processing time. Just because they're not speaking doesn't mean they're not learning, right? Yeah, come on, I'll show you an example later where we let the students have their own rules. And that's very creative. Reward the creativity, not just the English, not just well done, you said the sentence, it should be well done, that's super creative, right? And you, teacher, be a role model for creativity. If you are creative, the kids will be more creative. Let's look at a fun game. So this comes from Fun English for Schools, level two. So let's have a quick look. It comes from level two. I'm going to put the camera on now. Ooh, big screen. Hi, guys. I'm going to take the camera down here. So this is our app. And I think I said level two, unit 16. So these are the three levels. I'm going to turn it up so you can all hear. I think I said in level 16. I just want to show you a fun song and show you how something you could do with it, right? Here we go. Horse. Oh, not this one, sorry. <laughs> uh, wait, the song, here. Yeah. Do your best. A duck says quack, 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 quack. Ducks are red, white or black. A horse says nay, 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 nay. Horses are brown or gray. 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 A cow, cow says, says moo, 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 moo. Cows are blue. That's, That's not true. A goat says ma, a sheep says ma. They are green. No, they're not. Red ducks, orange horses. <laughs> It's one of my favorite songs from Fun English for Schools. So it seems like something very simple, right? A duck says quack, 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 quack. But there's so many opportunities there for, yeah, Nadi, you like that one, right? So whenever we, I use this song, I never just say, follow me. You have to do it my way. We'll say, okay, a duck says quack. And then we'll ask them, what actions do you want to do? So they might do quack, 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 or they might do quack, quack, quack. And then a cow says moo, so what's the action? And they all go however they want to do it, right? You could do it in separate groups because you're encouraging them to think about how do I want to do this and be creative. One, I love this song because it, it, it talks about, you know, brown cows, yellow goats, blue sheep. Just by taking two things and saying blue sheep, that's encouraging creativity because there's no blue sheep, right? So it's, it's and it's also critical thinking. The other one you can do is you start to change the, the animals. So then you hold up a chicken and it might be a chicken says, daka, daka. it doesn't matter, right? But as you're doing those simple songs, you're encouraging some creativity. So that was the first one. That's very nice from Fun English for Schools. If you don't have it, you write to me, we can share it with you for a trial period. So let's continue. 
I really, I really think that any song you do, just changing one word and asking them to change it, just going blank and asking them to change it is the easiest way. Many songs can be used. Yeah, exactly, right, Mark? That's a perfect point. Any song can be used, baby, shuck, 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 and then it could be baby, chicken, 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 chicken. As long as you're encouraging them to think about something different and do some substitute, I mean, really a substitution drill is creativity if you let them decide, right? So let's look at critical thinking. Yeah, exact. Paul, that's a perfect point. So Paul's, I think, son is how old, Paul? Three years old. Kids substitute and create on their own. And then we come to class and they want to do it, and then we say that's not the right answer. So, yeah, of course, let them do it on their own first and then just encourage it. So let's look at critical thinking. I think I got my slides around the wrong way, unfortunately. Critical thinking. Um, the things that we I say are don'ts. Um, I'll give an example later, but don't always give the answer. Every time a child asks you something, don't give the answer to them because then you're taking away from them a chance to think about the answer. Don't always model language in one way. I see a lot of teachers who just use flashcards, 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 flashcards. Flashcards are great, but if that's the only way a kid sees language, they won't have the concept that language comes from lots of different places, which is what critical thinking is about, seeing things in different places that are the same and different. And don't just say and repeat, because if it's just repeating, I'm not really thinking. So what we, what we can be, oh, what we can be doing, the simple things to really develop cri uh, critical thinking are things like comparison and contrasting, looking, spot the difference is a great one, uh, giving students time to notice, so if you give them a mistake and then say, okay, find the one with the mistake, perfect critical thinking. I've got to see this is right, this is wrong, I've got to decide which is the correct and incorrect. Um, Present language in as many different contexts as possible. And my, one of my favorites is just allowing for L1. Let them talk in their own language sometimes. Speak in your own language about this. Think about the differences and analyze this because usually their L1 will be much higher than their English, right? Let me just show you a quick example though, guys. Um, this is a really simple critical thinking activity and then I'll show you how we can present in many contexts. Well, let's just do it the other way around. So back to the app. I just wanted to show you that say we have something simple and what I love about technologies in the classroom is we have something as simple as colors. Now, in a lot of classes, we just show the colors, right? But what we want to show, let me do big screen, sorry. What we want to show is Look at this, we have colors coming in vocabulary cards and then a game and then a spelling game and then a dialogue and then another game and then some song and then another game and then they've got to blend things and then a quiz. So then they're seeing the colors in so many different ways and different contexts and different um, input that they really start, it really starts to, they start to see the difference between all these things, which is helping with the language, but also helping with their critical thinking. I mean, my, my favorite critical thinking activity is the simplest one. I know some of you have seen this before, but I'll just show it again. This is our lowest level. In this game, all they have to do is look at the picture and tell me what the colors are. Learn these words. So we click here. Orange. Orange. And then the kids have to think what would be orange. So they've got to pull from previous knowledge. They've got to think about what it would be. So what do you think would be orange? Orange. You can type it in. I know some of you have seen this before, but it's worth realizing it's a critical thinking activity. Go, Nadia. Orange. Yeah, right. The basketball. Orange. Let's do it quickly. Blue. Blue. What could be blue, blue. guys? Jayo. Go, Nadia. Just Nadia. The whale, blue. right? Blue. Yellow. Yellow. Is it the flower? No. Yeah, the duck. Yellow. Red. What could be red, Felicia? Good job, Felicia. Or the clock, yeah? Red. Or the heart. See, there's two right answers there. Pink. Pink. What's pink, guys? Is it the pillows? No. Yeah, the flower, pink. right? 
right. Yeah. Even a game, even a game is, oh, it's very bad. That's better. Let's go back to this. Ooh, it's very, yeah, okay. Even a game as simple as this really encourages critical thinking because I've got to think, okay, what have I seen before that is these colours and really take their minds to compare two things. The next one is collaboration. Um, for me, the don'ts don't always have to pick the students for the groups. You don't have to say, okay, you three and you three. It doesn't have to be you picking because you're, you're not giving them any control over the um, – oh, it's so funny how this, this, this camera keeps going out of focus. Um, if you're picking all the time, they're not having any control over the collaboration. They just think it's something the teacher is making me do. And sometimes when the kids are speaking to each other in their L1, they're actually collaborating. They might just be asking their friend, hey, what does the teacher mean or what is that? And they're just asking and it's actually learning is happening but we say, no, 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 don't talk. But actually, they're just collaborating together. Let's have a look. Sometimes, let your kids choose their own groups, of course. They probably choose the friend that they want to be with and the one they're going to learn with best. Allow for more peer interaction. And any chance that they have a chance to be working together, we know kids learn more off their friends than they learn off us. Um, always ask. Let them, I mean, always say to them, you know, who can help? One of my favorite things to say in class is, if, if Johnny asks me a question, I say, who can help Johnny, right? Um, always, you know, if they ask you a question, say, can, can you ask a friend? One of the big ones I like is not having competitions in class. I actually don't do any competitions. I just try to get the whole class involved in playing the game. So say I've got up on the IWB, a fun game, rather than have, yeah, presentations is awesome, Mark, because they've got to work together, work out who's first, second, um, when I'm playing games, I often just let the whole class play together and then the whole class wants to finish together and they all help each other and then they get to the final thing. Because in reality, once you leave school, you don't compete anymore. You're not competing. You're competing in when you're at work. You're not fighting with people all the time, I hope. Yeah, projects, presentations, drama, and also working with other teachers, right? Like you bringing in another teacher to your class is a great way to show kids that you can collaborate. So being a role model. Um, the last one is communication, and then I'm going to show you some examples. Um, with communication, I just want to say don't always stop L1, the first language. In, in China, I've noticed a lot of schools have big signs that say no Chinese in English schools. But why? I mean, the kids are, are, are actually probably helping each other. They're actually probably asking questions, and then they get stopped for doing that. And I don't understand that. I've never understood why we stop L1 in the classroom. It's kind of, it's a very outdated way of thinking about learning. Um, and don't have to correct everything. If you start correcting every time a kid is asking you a question, then they're not going to want to ask questions. So the do's, very simple. Encourage kids to make mistakes. Kids don't communicate because they're afraid to make mistakes. If they're willing to make mistakes, they're going to communicate more. Encourage asking questions. So I used to start, I start my classes and say every class, you come to class and you ask me three questions. I don't care what the questions are. Every child has to ask three questions to get into the classroom. So the very first thing you've done is hand over power to your student. They have to ask you a question. Sounds like I'm in power, but you're handing over there's something to them. They can ask you anything and they're speaking English as soon as they sit down. It's a really lovely way to say, if you want to come in, ask me a question, or you want to start the class, ask me a question. Um, and encourage peer communication, encourage them to use body language, and, and, and as I said, focusing on fluency and not just accuracy all the time will really help them with that communication. I want to hear what Felicia's going to say. I, I really like... Um, Oh, anyway, Felicia, I'll wait for you to type, but I'm going to show you. So, guys, I want to show you an example of an activity I did recently in Cambodia. So I was teaching some classes. We have a um, – we sponsor a couple of hundred kids in Cambodia that have less, dis less advantaged kids in uh, Cambodia, and we help them out by giving them some uh, tablets and some language learning. Uh, we work with the teachers as well. But what I want to show you is something really special about how kids – can do the four C's if you allow them to do it. So firstly, I'll show you the activity that we had on the big board 
and then I'll show you uh, what the kids did with this. So this activity comes from level one. It's a very low level activity. Yeah, I love that, Felicia. Thank you, Felicia or Felicia. I don't know which one it is, but it, it, I really appreciate you saying that. So let's have a look at this activity, guys. Very simple one. This is such a simple activity, right? So this comes from level one, and we've all, we've all played this game before, right? So up on the board, I played this game. Blue, red. No, and the kids have to come up and help me, right? So the whole class is playing together. Blue, blue. Right, and they're, and they're all helping each other. They're saying, number one, number two. Orange. Right? Orange. Oh, that was lucky. Yellow, red. Yellow, red. Ah, I'm stupid. <laughs> Yellow. Yellow. Red. Red. You'll notice um, all of our games scaffold, so they, they're always input plus one, so that the language doesn't get more difficult, but the, the gameplay gets more difficult. Pink, blue. Okay, so you, you know this game, guys. It's called Memory or it's called Palmanism. So what I, what, this is what I thought was really fascinating. I'm going to show you something really interesting. So I had this class and there was about 26 kids in the class and I had four iPads. I think I had four, not iPads, four tablets. And it doesn't have to be with tablets. It could just be flashcards, right? So they played up the front first. Then I handed out the, the tablets to each group. So I had four groups and each group had five kids. And I just opened the game and I put it on the table. And this is what I saw. So in this group, they all played together. They just, they just got together and started helping each other. So they really collaborated on how they were going to play. And they were really helpful to each other. In this group, they became really competitive. So they started saying, okay, it's my turn, I'm gonna do it, and then I'm gonna see how fast you can do it, then it's your turn, I'm going to do it, I'm gonna see how fast I can do it. So you see what's happening right there, that the two groups came up with a different way to play it. So that the next group, this boy um, was in a big group, but he said, I wanna go and take the iPad, the, the tablet to these teachers, and he decided, I wanna play with the teachers, which I thought was really nice, and in this group, they had this one where each person had a turn. So number one, number two, so you know, each uh, would be this guy and then this girl and then this girl, girl, girl would play. So in each of these groups, they came up with a different way to play the game. So what was happening here was creativity. They're being creative about how to play. They're being critical, they're using their critical thinking skills because it's coming back from old games I've played before. They're collaborating and communicating and at the center of it, they're learning English. So I thought that was a really lovely way to show you that, you that these skills sort of integrate together if you just let it happen. What I noticed was when the kids, yeah, if, if it's positive competition, then the games are very useful, right? Yeah. So anyway, in this game, they, they all came together and they all worked together. And what happened was language learning was happening. And what I noticed is when kids are left to collaborate and create on their own, learning takes place. If you just let it happen, then they knew, they were so motivated by the content that they just wanted to get this done. And I thought that was a really nice way to show you that kids do this on their own without any support from you, really. Um, I'm going to just show you one thing at the end, which I think really encapsulates the four C's. This is my favorite question that I hear students saying to me. So in my classes, I often hear this word, this this. Teacher, teacher, how to spell apple. Teacher, teacher, how to spell. Now, if anyone's lived in China, they know that's how kids say it. I know it's not the correct way. I know they should say, how do you spell? But they all say, how to spell, how to spell. What I see a lot of teachers doing is saying, teacher, the, the student says, how do you spell apple? And the teacher says, A-P-P-L-E, right? Now, obviously, that's not what you should do as a teacher. So just by doing these simple things, just saying, can you ask a friend, right? That's number one, ask a friend. So then they're communicating and collaborating, right? Ask a friend. Number two, who can help Andy? So Andy asked the question, I would say to the whole class, who can help? And then that's more communication and collaboration. Then I could ask them, another one I like to ask is, where can you find the answer, Andy? 
where can you find the answer? And maybe it's in his book, right? He was just doing it in his book, but you've got to get him to think, oh, how can I do this on my own? If he's still struggling, I'll say, look in your book, but then they've still got to be creative and critical thinking about where it was. Or you can go down the other route, which is the phonics route, and just say, how does it sound? Try to sound it out, Andy. A, a, apple, a, what sound do you think it is? A, oh, it's A, p, 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 right? So what I'm trying to say is, guys, that there are five opportunities there to encourage the four Cs. But, and I know you're probably already doing this. So what, I'm, what I want you to realize is that we're probably already doing the four Cs, but this is just showing you that even just saying ask a friend is actually developing collaboration. Even saying look in your book is developing critical thinking. Yeah, exactly, Mark, exactly. Oh, we're right on time today, a nice 50-minute session. I'm just going to give you some final thoughts, guys, and then I've got a few minutes for questions after that. I need to wrap up before five. So some final thoughts. Yeah, try yourself. I'll help you if you need, right? But I love, Nadia, I really love the one. It's like, can you ask a friend in the class? Learning happens with each other. And don't be nervous to come to you to, to go and ask other kids. So some final thoughts. These are, this is what I really think. Um, this is a really interesting idea that when I started teaching, a lot of teachers were, it was very teacher-centered. You know, back in the, well, I was in, in the early 2000s, but the 90s and 80s had a lot of teacher-centered education. And we knew that wasn't working. Although we still see a lot of it in, in big classrooms. Teacher at the front, write this word, kids write it, then they go to the next word, right? That's very teacher-centered. Well, we know that doesn't, it doesn't work very well. Then we started talking about student-centered, and that was a good development, like student-centered education, student-centered classrooms, where the student, you, you think about, are the students speaking? Are they asking questions? And that's great. And I think we should keep that. What I'd like to think about now, and a um, very fascinating lady called Diane Larson Freeman, uh, who is a great speaker and a great writer, I'm lucky to go see her next month in Cambodia, but she talks about learning-centered education. Is You don't, don't put the student at the center of the classroom. Don't put the teacher at the center. Sometimes the teacher should be at the center of the classroom. Put learning at the center. Always ask yourself, is learning happening in this classroom, right? And, and, and with the four Cs, what you start to notice is if they're collaborating, I bet you there's learning happening. If they're being creative, then something is happening that shows learning. If they're critically thinking, they're probably learning. And the point is, once you start integrating the four Cs, you have more guarantee of learning. And, and it's very hard to see if learning's happening. Now we have apps and digital technology. We can see um, all the data from the apps, and that's great. We know learning is happening. But this way, at least you're encouraging more learning. So just think about it. I'm not, I don't want to know now. I mean, it's about you. Just think, what do the four C's look like in my classroom? To me, what it looks like is kids speaking, kids sharing, kids arguing, kids trying to work together on, on things, right? That's what the four C's looks like. Silence is another one, because if, if they're thinking about something, they might have to have some calm times. But yeah, kids playing as well. Javita, I totally agree. If kids are playing, they're most likely developing those skills, because they're the natural skills that we develop when we play. I have a whole session on this, actually. Um, I have a question, a quick survey question. Are you ready? I'm going to put a survey up, and you have to try and answer. Which of the four, can you guys see the survey? Um, it should be on the screen now. It's which two of the four Cs do you think your students need to develop most? Just choose two. I'm very interested to see, and then I'll let you, and then I'll show you the results. Can, can you guys see? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, interesting. Maybe it's not only two. So there should be a survey on the screen. One person has answered. I don't know who it is. Oh, four people have answered. Anyone else? I don't know if you can see the survey. I think some of you can. Mika, I think there's a survey on your screen you can click on. Which two of the four Cs do you think your students need to develop most? Brian, can you see that on the screen, the, the, the survey? Yeah. 
If you, I think you can click a button on the screen. There should be like a drop down menu. 11 of you have done it. If anyone hasn't seen, I'll give you another 30 seconds. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to fill it in as well. I think my students need creativity and collaboration. Survey completed. Oh, 13 people. Anyone else? Yep, good. Nudges. And I'm going to show you the results now. Share results. Too late for everyone. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So we had, yeah, half the people say critical thinking and collaboration. That's interesting. Not creativity. So that's interesting. I, if I did, I'm sure if I did this in mainland China, creativity will be number one. Um, so it's just different. For, this is a global uh, survey. So it's interesting to know. And, and different countries will have different things they need to develop. But it's very interesting to see what you guys think. Uh, two more things. Of course, guys, this whole idea is not new. It's just been put together in education more. But of course, as Paul said, all of our kids have these skills when they're born. Not when they're born, but they, they've got these skills. So let's use these skills to make sure we can make more learning happening, and then our kids will be doing better. Our kids come to these with us with these skills, as we said. Let's integrate these skills into all aspects of our teaching. It shouldn't be, I'm going to do an activity now that encourages creativity. It should be, at all times, there's a chance to encourage collaboration or creativity. There's always a chance. Even just when a kid asks you a question, there's a chance to do this. You're probably already doing it all. I think that's what I noticed is most teachers are already doing it, but they just don't really realize it. So if once you get that click of like, I know I'm doing this, I'll do it better. So guys, that's it from me today. Of course, I always want to promote our website, uh, studycat.com. If you go on there, you can check out our blog, lots of nice articles, our webinars. You can check out our school products and stuff. Um, I, I, I highly encourage you to. I'm a big fan. I've put a lot of effort into building the website with the people here, so I think it's it's getting better. It's not great yet. I mean, it's not the best website yet, but it's getting there. Lots of information for you. If you sign up for the club, you get all these resources for your young learner classrooms. Um, lots of there's a really nice article there on the four C's by Rosie. Thank you, Mika. Um, and that's it, guys. Um, I will update the next three months worth of webinars in the next two days. We're doing lots of sessions coming up on, you know, more on the four C's and things, uh, things on pronunciation. That's a big missing link in pronunciation, things on listening, things on uh, more developing. It's just lo lots and lots of fun topics, okay? Oh, Van, how are you? You're from Vietnam, I guess. I'm guessing. Van Do, Van Do. Really good to meet you all again. Um, I think we've just added more people to our countries today, so that's awesome. We've now got, uh, I think we're looking at, that must be 45 countries now. When we get to 50 countries, we can have a party. Oh, Mark, you're in Vietnam as well. Your, your name seems very familiar, Mark, but I can't remember. Oh, it's hard to type on the tablet. Yeah, Victor, you know, I think most people are on PC today. Um, Victor is on a tablet and Naj is on a tablet. Oh, well, Victor, sorry about that. Cool. Good to see you all. Good to meet you all. And I will send out uh, this session as an email. I'll upload the video. You'll be able to watch it again. And then I use, send, I encourage you, if you're teachers, you can take the session and go and use it. Um, I'm very open to just taking whatever content we make. And peace. Have a great day. Yeah, good on you, Mark. Good to meet you. We'll actually be back in Saigon soon, actually, so be good to meet some of our real uh, webinar fans and have a chat. Thanks, Najas. Are you actually in Iran, Najas? Awesome. I'm so happy that we've got teachers from Iran now. That's great. Who else have we got? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, awesome. Nice. Okay, guys, have a great day. Thanks, Javita. I'm sure it's Javita, not Javita. Yeah. Bye, Vando. Bye-bye.